Uh, hair restoration has changed dramatically. The tendency has been towards a automated and robotic follicle unit extraction, harvesting little um, uh, embryologic hair units as they grow using uh, automated and robotic systems. But the, like any plastic surgery procedure, it starts with patient selection, realistic expectations, a good donor site, good recipient site, and then a lifelong plan for hair restoration if they have progressive male pattern hair loss. Our patient today, Adam, uh, had some frontal temporal thinning. He's had one restoration one year prior to this, and he's back for some uh, density, uh, frontal hairline amplification, and then densification. This would be his second procedure. We'll see his segmental before and afters. And then he would just uh, wait a number of years, perhaps indefinitely and permanently. Maybe he doesn't need more hair, or maybe he does. Uh, really, hair restoration is a lifelong plan and a relationship with that patient oh, over 20 years often. Uh, so Adam, um, today uh, we're going to be designing uh, a little amplification to your hairline. Uh, he wears his hair very, very short, uh, so whether you uh, harvest your, your hair through a strip graft technique or an FUE technique, uh, the artistry of the hair design really is the essential ingredient to a natural looking hair. Um, we'll talk about the back of the, of the scalp, the occipital donor, and then it's about the, the most scarless technique or try to avoid a linear scar uh, so that uh, a patient like Adam can wear his hair super short and not have the stigma of strip graft or large punk, punch graft uh, donor sites that we'd seen uh, in the past. Um, hairline design really is just looking at a face aesthetically, uh, looking at the da Vinci thirds, the upper third, middle third, lower third, looking at the shape of the face, uh, trying to def design three points and the triangulation of a hairline is mid frontal point and then temporal points. Once you've triangulated that, there's a number of different angles and measurements as if you were designing a rhinoplasty or deciding on uh, different proportions for volumizing the face. Hairline design is really an aesthetic gestalt of hair shape, scalp shape, uh, forehead, middle third and lower third heights and trying to make it look very, very natural. He's got a very natural hairline. He likes his hairline. All we're going to do today is there's a couple of areas where there has been um, uh, no significant hair growth. We're going to clean that up, but we never want the hairline to look tight. A little onside, offside design. So generally, I sit with the patient, have a look in the mirror here, and uh, and we want to design a hairline that looks uh, looks very natural. And so um, I look at the mid frontal point. Uh, Adam, are you pretty happy with that point? Yeah, or, that spot is great. Often we're trying to negotiate with a guy not to try and lower it too much. If they're older and have a weak donor site, we've got to keep that frontal point higher, even if it isn't as aesthetically pleasing. We've got to be able to protect it with density behind that. Uh, his hairline here is very nice. Uh, we maintained a very nice onside, offside design. Uh, which is a jagged look to the hair and we have always some random single hair follicle units uh, sitting out uh, at the front. <clears throat> the hairline design generally can be rounded, it can be tight, a lot depends on the angularity of the patient's face, the kind of hairline design where their temporal, um, their temporal tuft comes out. Uh, all these uh, factors play a role in designing the hairline. When we come to the other side, um, we need to amplify just a little bit here. Uh, just to, to create a little more symmetry. I like asymmetrical hairlines because it looks natural, but when we've got a few gaps like this, I do like to tighten it up a bit, but still keep that onside, offside, a design that looks very natural and round. He has a, he has a round shape to his, uh, to his face and a round shape to his hairline. So we're gonna fill in just a bit uh, through his frontal hairline here and densify that area so it doesn't have that see-through look. Uh, and then once we've done that, we're going to extend density amplification as far back as we can. There's a couple of tricks and techniques because when we're talking about the recipient site, we don't want to traumatize the hair bulbs uh, that we see. There will be always some hair bulbs that are intelligent and are not growing and they're at risk. So we, we want to use a technique that lifts and separates um, the hair bulbs so we can implant safely using little slit techniques. And that's where tumescent amplification, tumescent uh, injection will come in. And in general today, I suspect we're going to be able to get, um, you know, way back to, uh, we divide the scalp into the front third, uh, which is sort of a triangular shape, depending on the hairline. The middle third, which is always rectangular, and it is bounded by 
um, the crown, which is a circle behind it, uh, by the two parietal hairlines, which are generally going to go down with age, and we always have to leave enough hair to fill these in if they thin. And then the most unique part of the hairline is always going to be the uh, frontal temporal uh, um, analysis and design. Certain ethnicities, African American, Canadian, Caribbean, will have a straighter frontal hairline. Most Caucasian hairlines tend to have a little temporal recession. Um, and so we're going to do some densification in the front two thirds. Uh, this is his second uh, hair restoration procedure, and this will likely do him now uh, for a number of years. If you look to the uh, top part of the right hand screen, you'll see Adam's photo one year prior to this, where we actually had to define his frontal point, his two temporal points. He was very thin in his frontal temporal recessions. His parking lots were going back and his forelock was thinning. We designed the hairline. We got a great growth within 10 months and now we're back densifying this. And so we can see the progression from his pre-op one year ago to his pre-op today and then our amplification goals and densification goals during this enhancement procedure. Hair transplantation is uh, really, to me, one of the quintessential plastic surgery procedures. It involves selecting a donor site and we do a composite graft. We want like for like, a Millard principle. So we always want to try and draw from the scalp. Yes, in uh, hair restoration, using a non-strip graft technique like FUE, I've taken from the chest, I've taken from the thighs, I've taken from the back, but that's always a poor secondary choice, like for like. So our donor site is typically going to be the occiput. We don't know why uh, male pattern hair loss has this uh, genetic curse. It's passed down in the gene code where the central oval hair uh, has a 5-alpha reductase deficiency, a poor enzyme that can't break down testosterone into usable metabolites. You get a buildup of DHT and that over time uh, affects the mitochondria of the central oval hair and it's subject to ongoing loss. Yes, we have propecia and androgen blockers. We have low, uh, high fluence, low level light therapy. We have minoxidil. We have nutrients. We have stem cell injections. But dead hair is dead hair. We can't bring it back, so we need to transplant. What's our donor site? Well, let's look right here. And Adam is why FUE, in my opinion, is the technique of choice. If you look how short Adam likes to wear his hair, he's had 3,000 follicular units harvested one year ago. If it was a strip graft, and that works beautifully, strip graft is still probably the gold standard in most hair transplant centers, but it is very hard for a gentleman to wear his hair that short with a strip graft, which is prone sometimes to um, spread scar, to widening, and a white visual um, background amidst a, a dense uh, topography, which is the occipital donor. And so he's had 3,000 follicular units harvested and these have left him with a very natural looking scalp. He could wear a number one blade, two blade, or a three blade shave and still look very natural. So um, when designing uh, your donor site, it's very important to look at the crown and likely where the crown may go and always take the worst case scenario. So if he crowns out, his vertex becomes enlarged over the, uh, over the course of the next 20 years, we do not want to harvest hair from the posterior aspect as vertex or that will fall out. We want a Friar Tuck George Costanza donor site that's very tight just above the occipital ridge and keep our donor site from here. Now, in general, it's been my uh, experience over the last uh, five, six, seven years that we can harvest 15% of this donor site at any given time and up to 50% of the occipital hair and in moderate density scenarios, uh, patients don't look thin. So donor site selection, very important. Some have a very poor donor site. Probably 50% of, uh, of my FUE transplant patients have had previous strip grafts or previous punch grafts, and you need to take that into account in what goals they have. In general, we can take 10,000 follicular units over the course of 10 to 15 years. And if you put your head back here, Adam, 10,000 follicular units gives you 3,000 on the front third, a second densification amplification like today, and then you're done. So maybe 5,000 devoted to the front 30% of the hair because that's how people see you. Then I always reserve around 2,000 to 3,000 for the middle third. Now we're up to 7, 7,500 hairs, maybe 8,000, and never overgraft the crown. 
unless, of course, they've proven uh, and they're in their late 50s or 60s, they're never going to go to a Norwood 6, then you can go aggressive on the crown. The problem is when young men present and they've got some crown thinning, vertex thinning, they want to put a lot of hair there. And I know 15, 20 years from now, they're going to need it up here. So you need to be very responsible, long-term visionary for your patient and advocate for conservatism posteriorly because anteriorly they're going to need it. Uh, the second phase of a uh, donor site preparation after selection of the recipient and how much of the donor you need is actually shaving the hair and that um, really requires um, an FUE hair transplant uh, patient to plan a good 10 days to two weeks off uh, for the donor site to grow out to a number one blade length. So most guys will do one of two things. They grow, they grow their hair very long like a mullet and they lift the mullet up, we shave a little patch, and the hair hides it, and that's how women do it. And women are, are good candidates for, for FUE, especially for Ludwig thinning in the front. Or they do like Adam, they shave their head completely down to a number three blade everywhere, and then let just both the recipient site uh, grafts and the donor site grow out together. But you still need about 10 days to two weeks off until everything looks nice. Uh, so first of all, we're gonna shave down to uh, less than a number one blade uh, for our harvest. And in general, the harvest is going to be, zoom in if you can get in here. The harvest is going to be in that preferred site, just below the nuchal ridge uh, to uh, just shy of what would be the risk uh, for posterior crowning and then right around what would have been the old buckle ha bucket handle locations for a strip graft um, above the ear. We don't want to venture into the temporal areas. That hair caliber is thinner and it doesn't match like for like a uh, front frontal temporal restoration. We save that for things like mustache and beard and sideburn restoration or eyebrow or even eyelash restoration which is also uh, very good for the FUE technique. So we're going to go ahead and shave. We prepared the donor site, now we have to uh, provide some anesthesia. This is all done under local anesthesia, uh, typical infiltrative sub-Q anesthesia, nerve block anesthesia, and tumescent anesthesia. Most patients have had a little oral sedation. I use um, benzodiazepine, two milligrams of lorazepam, a little Toradol preoperatively and intercurrently during the day. The average patient will get about four milligrams of lorazepam depending on their body weight during a eight hour transplantation. It's about an eight hour to nine hour process for 3,000 follicular units. Three to four on the harvest, a little break, uh, three and a half to four, four and a half on the implantation. Uh, so uh, we've got our donor site demarcated. You'll see that we've created little areas where the trays need to be set up for the robot, so we're going to see the artist robotic harvest technique today. Now we have to provide anesthesia. True tumescent anesthesia makes um, uh, the artist doesn't like true tumescent like you would use for uh, lipoplasty. And so generally I'll do some blocks, uh, you know, the nerve distribution, the posterior occipit's a little variable. You've got your occipital and the two lesser occipital nerves and the uh, posterior great auricular nerves you have to block. So I just basically do a regional block inferiorly, regional block superiorly, and then uh, just a random um, field block. And, and then once we've um, defined the area, we'll do some tumescent anesthesia. When we get to the front, typical frontal temporal block is going to be superobra, supertrochlear, and tumescent anesthesia in the recipient site. And so uh, I pick the center of the nuchal ridge um, and within two finger breaths are going to be the occipital and the two lesser occipital nerves so we block them. I'll try not to get in the way here. And a simple little infiltrative anesthesia. This is a, about half a percent. I go along the base about every two centimeters. I do the right half of the scalp first, the left half second. Um, a little gauze please guys. And so um, we'll talk about, uh, we did talk about the business of hair restoration and how um, I'm, I'm a big believer that the doctor needs to be in control of the process. The doctor does the consultation. The doctor works with the patient on a vision and a plan. The doctor decides and designs the hairline. The doctor needs to do the anesthesia. The anesthesia part, like anything that we do under local, is the riskiest part. We have to know about lidocaine toxicity, about the signs of lidocaine toxicity, have in your facility the, the ability um, to, um, to resuscitate a patient were they to get um, a complication from Lido or a complication from, uh, from Epi. Uh, so patient selection, I still do a cardiogram, 12 lead cardiogram and blood tests on all my hair restoration patients, make sure they don't have a bleeding abnormality, they don't have any unknown hypokalemia, uh, and they don't have some conduction abnormality because there's a fair amount of adrenaline in our tumescent fluid. And uh, some of these guys are a little older, they may have some silent ischemia. And if there's any evidence of an old MI, ST abnormalities, um, I just don't do them or send them to an internist and get it adjudicated before doing the procedure.
There are two FU harvest techniques that I use. We don't use manual, but we do an automated follicular unit extraction. That's called Neograft. And we do a robotic follicular unit extraction, and that's the artist. So let's, uh, let's take a look at our artist device and how it works. So we bring in the uh, robotic arm of the artist. Uh, this is an offshoot of the Da Vinci and the Da Vinci Company. Uh, we're going to bring the artist device in. And then we're using a computer-generated uh, model and algorithm from the company uh, that allows us to design and devise um, which hairs we want to select for harvest, the angle of the rotatory punch that's powered by the robot, and the depth of that punch. So we're going to take a look up at the screen. And on the screen, you can see that um, we're doing some calibration registration points that the uh, robot will calibrate uh, the sides of the tray to position of the scalp and starts to take um, images of hair. And you can see the punch going in and it's selecting double and triple hairs. It's going in and taking the punch. Now we'll take five or six of those and analyze if the robot's right. Is it the right depth and the right angle? So there is some human control here. It's a very, very robotic process, but with human guidance. And we guide the depth and the angle. So now that we're going to stop, we're going to stop. Let's come back onto the scalp. We're going to analyze those graphs to make sure there's been no transection, make sure it's the right depth, make sure that we have good matrix around the bulb and the shaft. Once we've got what we like and it looks good, then we start uh, the repetitive process of a harvesting. And in general, it can be between 700 and 900 follicle units harvested um, per hour. The second technique that I use for automated and robotic FUE harvest is called Neograft. Now the Neograft, the robot, is the brain of the technician or the surgeon. It's a rotatory punch that's motored like artists, however the angulation, zoom in on the harvester, this is called the harvester, the angulation and the depth is determined by two or three graft attempts and then the angulation of this rotatory punch is determined by the technician. So you need an excellent technician with, uh, with the neograft, and that's the biggest criteria. With artists, your technician is the robot, and the technicians guide the angulation depth, but the robot's very accurate on its angulation. Now, uh, of course, there can be robotic errors because you miscalculated the angle. The nice thing about the neograft, as opposed to the artist, is that it, it cores 
aspirates along the tubing and collects in a canister. And so you don't have to take the interrupted moments to stop and then take the grafts and extract them manually. And there's some avulsion trauma with that technique that may or may not affect graft viability. I think these are equally viable as a, as a composite graft technique. And you have a good technician, you can harvest uh, seven, 800 gr uh, grafts per hour with the robot, seven, 800 grafts per hour. So there's not much speed difference. However, you need an excellent technician for neograft. You need good technicians for artists. There's disposable, consumable discussions and capital cost equipment that we can talk about during the actual, uh, during the meeting. Okay, now before we do this, we augment our, uh, our anesthesia technique and we're going to do tumescent anesthesia. So simple, similar to, let's uh, say, uh, if I was doing lipoplasty, we're going to tumesce, we tumesce the scalp. Why do we tumesce the scalp with this technique uh, versus we don't when we're doing uh, the, the uh, robot? Um, we're going to move in here a little tighter. Uh, with this technique, um, this helps rotate. Um, it rotates the, gr the uh, shafts up and out, so they add a very consistent angle. Um, the tumescent anesthesia, um, it confuses the robot, number one, because uh, it changes optical uh, recognition. And number two, when it starts to rotate, it's not a sharp punch, uh, the artist and the robot, and you get some spinning of the rotatory punch. So I use tumescent for the neograft uh, automated and non-tumescent uh, for artists um, uh, robotic. And so now he's already numb, so the actual tumescent technique is very straightforward. Um, we do make sure that the tumescent technique tumesces the scalp fully. We, want to, we don't want to need peau de range type of tumescent, but we want to make sure that that scalp is very, very, very tense. Sort of a super wet technique of the scalp. The, the, the plane that I'm in is uh, in the Galea aponeurotica, so we're, we're just above uh, occipitalis, but we're under the dermis and the sub -Q. That nice sweet areolar plane you might tumesce if you were doing, let's say, on uh, the anterior brow, if you're doing a brow lift under local. Or, or a flap for scalp reconstruction. So you tumesce that up very nicely. Now, it takes that 35 degree angulation, the occiput rotates the shafts up and presents them very nicely for the, uh, for the um, automated rotatory um, harvest technique. The steps of the neograft automated punch, number one, we have a little plastic cap and that's our depth gauge protector. And we take one or two sample grafts, we'll cut this back um, so that we have a depth gauge that stops the rotary punch from going deeper. The next step is that the technician or the physician needs to angle the angle of the shaft. The tumescent fluid allows the shaft to rotate up and be very consistent in its presentation. And then there is a foot pedal, a rotatory coring, and then the suction lifts the graft out, it's dragged along the surface of the scalp, and then a valse gently comes along the tubing and collected in the canister. In the canister, there's a little strainer that prevents the tubing from coming right down into our collection canister on the side of the machine right here. So it's compression, suction, aspiration. Let's go back and show a couple of harvests now. So the technician or the physician gets the right angle, puts the foot on the pedal, cores the graft out, then lifts, drags, and then avulses and aspirates the graft up into the machine. It goes along the tubing and collects here in the canister. Intermittently we keep that very moist so there's no desiccation. Again, uh, foot on the pedal, rotation, lifting, avulsing, the fibrous attachments to the bulb, and then aspirating into the tubing, along the tubing, into the canister. Now, slowly going up and taking some uh, fluid and keeping those grafts constantly moist. So one of the complaints that strip graft physicians will have with either artists or neograft is that there's a rotatory thermal injury. To me, there's only three or four rotations of that rotary punch, and so to me that makes no sense. Number two, uh, that there is some desiccation of the grafts limiting their viability. At the end of the day as plastic surgeons we know how to do composite grafts. You don't traumatize the viable matrix, you keep it moist, we put them on ice, and then you implant them. And I see no difference in viability uh, between artist uh, and the uh, neograft, and certainly no 
diminished viability over a strip graft technique. Remember that strip graft is handed off to technicians and for your one and a half, two hours is being divided and cut with a, uh, with a razor blade under, uh, under microscopic lights. That is also going to be somewhat traumatic to the bulb. No matter what the harvest technique, a well-oiled uh, machine, a well-orchestrated um, implant process, I think viability of a graft is 85% plus, whether it's strip or automated or robotic harvest. So once we've harvested about 150 um, of these using the automated technique, maybe do a few more there, uh, Isaac, and you can go along quickly, drop your hand more so we can see. Excellent. And once we've done a few of those, uh, usually about every 50 to 100 grafts, um, and we've got the harvest, and we can usually do about six, 700 an hour. And generally, just like the robot, we harvest one, leave four or five hairs around. Harvest another, leave four or five around. We always leave enough hair in between the donor sites so you don't get uh, a localized alopecia. So now we're gonna slowly, slowly disconnect our harvest canister. The second technician comes in slowly, slowly, come back here, lift the tray up. I wanna see the graphs. Slowly means you move slowly, guys. That's the, the S-L-O-W-L-Y, slowly. Okay, so give that to me. Okay, so we're gonna lift up our canister. And as you can see here along the sidewalls, we have our graphs. So on the tray, we have our graphs. Zoom in on that side. And you can see all the little graphs, nicely moist and clumped. We put it on a little saline bed with some telfa. And then that's handed off to our second technician. The second technician will take it over to the microscope and start to count and sort. We put another um, strainer in our canister and start harvesting again. Again, quality assurance, whether it's robotic or automated, quality assurance. Okay, so these are the, uh, um, this is the NeoGraft automated uh, FUE harvest system. And if you zoom in on that again, just like we had with, our, um, with the robotic, you see beautiful little graphs with just the pristine amount of matrix around the bulb, our two and three hair and one hair graphs. Um, and these are being sorted out to the one, two and three hair, uh, put in piles of one, two, three and four hair follicle units. And then critically, to decrease the metabolic rate to optimize survival, they're put in a wet saline telfa pad on ice, decrease the metabolic rate, because they're gonna be outside of a vascular environment for four hours to five hours so if we come back here you'll see that right away they're put give me your ice so we keep them uh, on ice give me the uh, give me the petri dish so they're kept in a telfa pad and they're kept on ice and um, and kept cool to decrease that metabolic rate again to optimize um, uh, survival post implantation We have, uh, during this brief break, we've spent time under a microscope and we've taken our graphs and we've assigned them um, numerical count, meaning the one hair follicle units, one bulb, one hair, two hairs per bulb, uh, then threes and fours. The ones and the twos are most important because we, um, to, to, uh, um, to uh, numerically uh, assign uh, and identify because we put them towards the front. So if we look here, this has been sitting on ice, it's very cool. Each little packet has 100 graphs in it. Each little packet is 100. And back here, which is our standard um, location, these are going to be the four packets with one graphs. And often takes four to 500 to span the entire frontal hairline. And these are going to be um, on side, off side, jaggedly placed because we don't want a Ken doll hairline. We're going to talk about uh, hairline aesthetics. Straight hairlines are really old school. We want a very natural hairline you can't tell it's been done. And then we'll have, um, we'll have our two hair follicle units and then the threes and fours, two threes and fours are admixed together at the back because we disperse them throughout the posterior part for densification. The ones and then the twos near the front. They've been sitting on a, on a, a bed of ice here, nice and cold, 
and so they have been uh, protected against uh, hopefully um, superoxide radicals and ischemia and they're ready to be implanted as a as a free hair graft like doing conchal cartilage grafting or co um, complex uh, three-dimensional full thickness skin graft. Now the next thing is we don't want to induce any trauma. We've drawn a hairline, we've got the onside offside patterning, we put all the ones near the front and at the back ones and twos to stagger a jagged onside offside hairline. If you look at his hairline, he's had his hairline done before. You really wouldn't know that that was was transplanted. He had virtually no hairline before. It looks very, very natural. We just want to, you know, fill in little areas, even add some more random ones to the front. Having a few ones sitting one or two millimeters out in front of your designed hairline looks very natural. Okay, now how do we not damage the hair transplant we did a year ago? We use classic tumescent anesthesia. You can see the uh, whiteness he has down here, vasoconstriction. I did a super trochlear, super orbital block. He's completely anesthetic. We want to lift and separate the bulbs so when we slip between them during implantation technique, we don't traumatize uh, the active bulbs that he has. And so we simply do a classic tumescent technique. And we just lift and separate. If you zoom in on that, you'll see is uh, scalping lifting and separating those bulbs, lifting and separating the bulbs uh, so we can get at the hair without traumatizing, identify the gaps between the hair, and then over time, 12 hours as it comes out, all the hairs come together again. So it allows us to really, what I call, densely pack. Um, in the old days, they would call it micrografting because, remember, we don't divide we harvest the hair as it grows in the back and we implant it. We don't divide, we don't cut, we don't segregate. We do very, very little, if any, post-graft modification. And so uh, we took Mother Nature's bulbs uh, with their hairs as they grow. If they've got a nice curly hairline at the back, a uh, nice curly hair at the back, they'll have lovely curly hair at the front. One of the complaints with hair restoration in the past is that uh, when the uh, strip graft was being modified, it was being modified so much you'd cut down to 5,000 single hair grafts, and when you lost all your genetic hair and all you have is your transplant hair, it looks unnatural because it's not wavy, it's a bunch of spiky hair. Because there's no relationship of one shaft to another. Almost all that you see here is transplant hair. It looks very natural. When it grows it long, it's very wavy because we left the uh, the genetic relationships of one hair to another intact by not dividing them, by leaving them attached to their, to their embryologic uh, unit, to the bulb, and that is called the follicular unit um, philosophy or technique and follicular units only really became became known in hair restoration in uh, in the 90s. You know, it was really the late 90s that we started to identify. Wow, hair had an embryology to it, and they all they grew in specific patterns and in specific relationships. Okay, a little pressure right here. Excellent. So uh, we're going to come back in a second, and we'll show the implantation. Other than needle technique, um, the Neograft in particular has an automated implanter. The concept being when you use this type of device, and if we can zoom in on this, I'll just show it against the white of my coat. Um, this little device is interesting. It's got a little plex clear plexiglass. You take your grafts and you aspirate, so there's a suction, and it sucks um, hair shaft first up into the chamber. Then you simply place this into your open slit in the scalp and you put your foot on the pedal and the plunger comes down slowly and ejects the graft into your defect. The concept being that at no point do you have to squish the graft, 
with your jeweler's forceps, minimizing, theoretically minimizing trauma to the matrix, to the bulb. It's called a no-touch technique, like the no-touch breast augment technique. Complications are theoretically less the less you handle the graft. Now, again, this concept in theory works, but if you have technicians with decades of experience and you have 90 plus percent growth, then their touch technique is obviously gentle. When you're first learning, it's actually easier to learn with an implanter than it is to learn really fine, elegant, swift, one or two hand technique. You can implant with this about 200 grafts an hour. A good tech can, uh, can implant 250 to 300 freehand. And if you have two techs implanting, you're shooting for 600 grafts implanted per hour, sometimes 700. If you have two implanters, you're down to around 400. Now imagine if you have 3,000 grafts, that's 400 times seven, that's seven hours of implantation. Rather than uh, two freehand techs who are good, at 300 each, that's 600 per hour, it's a five, that five hour implantation process. Sometimes I will use the implanter for very delicate single hair implants along the front where we're down to the last of their very minimal donor site they've had previous strips, previous punches, and we want the least traumatizing technique. We'll sometimes use this then just for the single grafts. They're the most delicate, they have the least matrix around the bulb, and we have to be much, much more careful. Okay, we're back. Uh, it's the end of our transplant day. We've done artisan neograft, automated and robotic restoration. Uh, we'll point out a couple of features about the recipient site, post-op care, and the donor site. If we take a look at Adam here and we take a look at the recipient site, let's just tight, come in tightly here. Uh, what we've done is a density amplification of his frontal third. We didn't change the essential gestalt of his frontal hairline. Cell has a nice hairline and what we've done if we can zoom right in there even tighter head down you can see what we've done is broken up uh, with some single hairs some of the post transplant irregularity. Um, if you can see very closely in these graphs you have a little sanguineous crust all the graphs are about one or two millimeters proud so that the three-dimensional contraction of a composite graft will make them flush with the surface. If you make them flush right away, the retraction that occurs with composite grafting uh, and, and the uh, leads to an indentation and a cobblestone look. So he'll have a very natural looking scalp. Very important that we have them in just the right angulation uh, and just the right uh, density matching from the back to the front. And so that's a density amplification from a good result. Now we went to a virginal area, and that was uh, the middle third. In general, we can go back to the same donor site within three months if we want, but we have to transplant into a new area. I usually make guys wait a year, make sure they're happy with the primary restoration, and then we go into a new area. And we've done a lot of density amplification in his middle third, but we left the crown alone. What are the instructions? No air on this area for one to two days. We'll see him back and we'll do a video when he comes back. We'll show him how to wash and shampoo with a little cup of water. Very delicate um, uh, care of this scalp for about one month. No direct um, shower nozzle spray, um, no helmets, no rubbing, no friction. Nothing touches this for two days but air. That's the management of the recipient site. We're gonna turn Adam around and take a look at the donor site. Now let's take a look at Adam's donor site and the management of the donor site. If we take a look, um, compared to a strip graft, the early recovery phase for a follicular unit extraction, be it automated or robotic, um, it looks worse actually, very early on, it looks very odd. If you, you zoom right in, you can see we've got 3,000 little 0.9 to 1.2 millimeter follicular unit extraction sites or uh, coring um, um, donor sites. And uh, each one of these has surrounding it four or five hairs so it never looks too harvested from any given area. Each session we can harvest up to zoom out, we can harvest 
excellent. About to, up to 15% of the donor site density, and that means over four or five sessions, we can harvest 50, 55, sometimes 60% of the donor hair and not have a patient looking uh, too thin. Um, if they're gonna shave their head um, completely like Vin Diesel shave it um, type of, um, of, a, of a look, you could see little white marks where these used to be, but they heal surprisingly well to the point where even a number one blade, you can't see this. Now we're gonna put a dressing on here. We'll bring them back tomorrow. Um, and then we'll take that dressing off. And you, if it's not looking bloody, we can leave that off. And he can wear a baseball cap that touches here. The baseball cap comes around, touches his forehead, head back. And if as long as it's not touching uh, Adam's recipient site, he can wear a baseball cap by the second or the third day and hide everything and go away on a vacation. It's gonna take about one to two weeks for the stubble to grow out here in order for this to look blended. So we're gonna see him at uh, the very early post-op day and videotape that. We'll see him back at one to two weeks and then at one month and then we'll see him maybe at six months and of course you'll have his before and after at one year okay so we're gonna put a dressing on the dressing consists of a little bit of telfa zoom in on this telfa and an antibiotic ointment the telfas are placed along the scalp and then it's um, wrapped with a little gauze and goban. We bring them back the next day and take it off. Often patients on the day one or day two post-op don't need the band at all and they can be open to air. So we're gonna go ahead and put the dressing on. So we apply a little bit of polysporin to the area with the telfa and then stick the telfa down. Excellent, apply a little polysporin. Stick the telfa down. Excellent. And we do the same thing right across the scalp. This helps prevent the telfa sticking to the sanguinous exit uh, holes from the rotatory punch. And really it's quite, it looks quite abnormal initially, but by one week, I tell most guys they need one to two weeks off, They'll be in a ball cap by three days. The stubble makes it very difficult to see at one week, completely not visible at two weeks. If guys can take two weeks off their corporate jobs and go away on a holiday with a baseball cap on, they'll look okay at two weeks. If they've worn their hair short, no one's gonna know any difference. Very, very um, gentle wrap here. We don't wanna do too aggressive a wrap or it's gonna potentially cause problems uh, from being too tight in the forehead. The swelling will come out of the forehead over that first 24 hours and um, will minimize then the uh, tightness of the wrap. Excellent, so we apply that to the scalp. And then we use a little bit of, a, a little bit of Coban uh, to uh, wrap that area very gently. And so we do a little bit of Coban, gently wrap that around, include the top of the auricle top of the ear cartilage, not too tight. You want to get one or two fingers in here and not make it too tight. It can cause some skin problems on the forehead. And then we wrap nice and loose. And we'll bring um, our young man back tomorrow. He's gonna take an antibiotic prophylactically. Uh, probably you could just do one or two days prophylactically. I keep them on usually for five to seven days. Um, very unusual to get a cellulitis, but one of the complications is scalp cellulitis, and that can kill grafts. Uh, the other complication is related to friction, and patients not paying attention to delicate treatment of that recipient site, and mechanical uh, trauma from uh, patients not following instructions properly. Uh, and um, that's very unusual. It can cause sometimes a telogen effluvium, both of the re recipient hair, that is causing a shock hair where we place the grafts. Yeah, it usually comes back. Sometimes that can be permanent. And sometimes it causes a telogen effluvium of the implanted hairs. In general, with uh, automated robotic hair, half the hairs fall out, the other half start growing. Those other half start growing at six months and contribute. So by 12 months, you have a total um, densification of maximum contribution. So it usually takes about 12 months. And in general, um, success rate, between 85 and 95% of the grass will grow if treated in a very delicate fashion, both by the rotatory technique of harvest, if the grafts are kept moist and on an ice bed, and implanted within a few hours into a vascular bed where there's no trauma postoperatively. As all composite grafts, you'd expect well over 90% successful growth.
Uh, we're back on day two post uh, procedure, post artist and neograph follicular unit automated rob uh, and robotic follicular unit extraction and transplantation. Uh, you saw the dressing placed, a uh, little telfa polysporin and a coban wrap. Uh, we have our patient back here today, uh, Adam. Um, that's what the dressing generally looks like the next uh, next day and the day after. We saw him at 24 hours. Often we see patients back like today at 48 hours. How would you describe the pain? Was it pain, discomfort? What was your experience like after the procedure? No, there was very little pain and um, I actually feel very good. Great. Yeah. Uh, have you had other operations, knee, appendix, any other kind of surgery? No. no. Um, so if the worst pain you've ever had in your life was a 10, how would you grade this discomfort? Oh, I would have to call it maybe a four, okay. five. Yeah. So often two to four, two to five would be, um, normally it's not a narcotic pain, it's a non steroidal anti-inflammatory like a Toradol. Uh, so the Toradol you had was more than enough to cover the discomfort? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So most people uh, find wisdom teeth extraction more painful. Um, certainly with a strip graft technique, uh, there can be quite a lot of sensitivity at the back, even numbness and neuritic uh, pain, discomfort, and um, lack of dysesthesia above the scar. Uh, although I, I think some of that is overrated the strip grab generally heals well, but there's a lot more pain with a strip grab than with FUE, uh, no question. Uh, so now we're going to take the dressing off, uh, and um, uh, so go ahead there, Isaac. We're going to just take that dressing off, and we'll take a quick look at uh, the donor site, uh, and then uh, after the donor site, we'll analyze the recipient site, what to do, what not to do. Okay, uh, we've taken the wrap off. Let's take a look at now at uh, our patient's donor site. We just take the Telfa off. Head down just a bit, Adam, perfect. So we take the Telfa off, and it's still moist uh, with a little bit of a polysporin. Let's zoom right in on that, and as you can see, you've got the sort of level three um, sort of shave, and then we've got the patch that we've had to, we've had to do our uh, very, very tight uh, shave. And you can see that, um, that already it's very hard to see uh, the 0.9 millimeter follicular unit uh, rotatory punch. Uh, you can see that even the ones that were 1.2 millimeters for the threes and fours, and I'm not sure if we can zoom in close enough, you can see there's even a difference in the size. You can see most of these guys down here, these are all 0 0.8, 0 0.9 millimeter, and then where some of our three and four uh, hair follicular units are 1.2 millimeter. Now, from this point, day, f day two on, by about, uh, we'll see them at one week, we'll see them at two weeks, by two weeks, this stubble will have grown out around here. So uh, then the barb would blend in the um, level three, level three with a three blade with a one blade. So it all looks good at about two weeks. Today he can leave wearing a baseball cap from here uh, to the front with no pressure on the recipient site. So a ball cap, we can uh, show him in a ball cap today. And he can start shampooing. We use two finger technique, a mild shampoo. We can start to get some of these crusts off, okay? We're gonna come back in a second and talk about the recipient site. We're now back on day two, we're gonna look at the recipient site. If we look at the recipient site now, uh, this is very typical for a day two or 48 hour recipient site. If we zoom in close here, zoom in tight, you can see we did density amplification, a little bit of correction of the hairline. Uh, and you can see the little stubbles, each of those little stubbles are nicely placed and around the stubble is a little sanguineous crust that's exuded, has exuded from the slit. Now that it's a dry crust, it takes about two weeks for the crust to come off. Uh, and then because he wears his hair short, there'll be little erythema in the scalp bed, but he'd be able to wear his, uh, basically, his hair will look like all about the same, uh, same, um, same length and will grow together. Back here in the middle third, you can see we've done a lot more densification. And then as we move to the front third, um, we've done density amplification. At this point, we show them how to wash just cups of water, no direct spray from a shower, no trauma, no helmets, no aggressive activity or exercise with a lot of sweating or venous hypertension or Valsalva removers, uh, Valsalva maneuvers. And then today, he's gonna be able to leave with a baseball cap on. So uh, zoom out just a bit. Adam, go ahead and put on your baseball cap here. And uh, generally by day two, without any pressure on the top, um, patients can leave. Patients can leave with a ball cap on. So that's our goal. We do a procedure generally under local. We make it very comfortable. 
uh, with anesthetic techniques the way they are now, most and uh, little oral uh, benzodiazepine and a non steroidal anti inflammatory. Most patients don't describe it as painful. Dental procedures are more painful. By day two, there's really no pain, just an itchiness. So we use a Claritin H2 blocker, a non steroidal anti inflammatory, and now it's just a matter of waiting. So the donor site hair, uh, the, the unharvested hair grows out and, and you can't see the holes. That'll be about 10 days to two weeks. At the same time, the crusts have come off the top and you can go without a hat. So with FUE technique as it's done today where hair's worn short in the front, most guys have to take two weeks off work and then we can get them back into their activities of daily living and usually their work environment. We're back here now one week following our automated and robotic follicular unit extraction and transplantation. If you recall, it was a densification, amplification of a frontal and, and uh, enhancement of the frontal temporal hairline, and then the middle scalp densification. At one week now, let's take a look at the donor site. At one week, let's zoom, test it out, the distance, then come in tight. As I described on day two, by one week, it's almost impossible to see the follicular unit harvest. It's almost impossible to see the 0.9, the 1, or the 1.2 millimeter punch sites. And so by one week, the stubble is growing out, still a little long on the number two or three blade above and below. And between one week and 10 days, most guys have got their barber to blend in the, the two level, two tone look. Uh, but what, one week, most guys with a little uh, shave are actually blended in nicely. This makes the technique by far the most superior way to harvest hair, in my opinion. There's no other technique that uses excisional surgery that would give this type of result. So follicular unit extraction, automated and robotic, I think is the state of the art uh, methodology for harvesting hair for transplantation. So let's take a look at the recipient site. Let's take a look at one week at our patient's recipient site. At the recipient site, if we start out wide and come in tight, perfect head down now, most patients can start to feel pretty confident uh, if they have long hair and they're using their middle third uh, and their uh, frontal temporal zone to camouflage. No one can tell at all, but even with very short hair, uh, as uh, our patient does here, you can see in Adam's middle third, very, very tight transplantation result. He's describing that little crusts are falling off, which is normal. We have them washing with cups of water. Um, uh, very gentle at this point, at two weeks, 10 days to two weeks, very gentle shampoo with fingertip. Uh, type of uh, massage. The crust will come off usually by the second week and about 50% of the grafted um, hairs will stay in place and start growing. The other 50% will fall out, temporary telogen effluvium, and start growing at four to six months. Um, if we look at the frontal temporal zone here, again, the hairline restoration the same. So generally most guys um, can go back to work, especially with long hair, by seven days. The back is camouflaged. And they, and they do a little shave balance. And then the front area is a shampoo, light shampoo with cups of water, and the scabs have fallen off by 10 days to two weeks. Once you're back at work, we start a post-operative care routine. Uh, at my center, um, we use high-fluence, low-level light therapy, high-fluence, low-level light therapy in the green and the red spectrum to enhance mitochondrial activity, oxygenation. They come in once a week. Uh, these are very high power bulbs, not like a laser comb or a laser cap. These are 50 milliwatts per amp, uh, per uh, lamp, and uh, they sit under these lamps once a week. We do that for about six months. The other thing we do is add a nutrient shampoo uh, with things that help, um, help with the growth of the, of the neovascularized bulbs. And then at about six weeks, that's we initiate those things at uh, two weeks, uh, one week with the lights, two weeks for the shampoo, and at six weeks, I institute a uh, very strong 50% minoxidil or vasodilatator with topical nutrient serum that they do at night. So one week they start with the uh, laser light program, the high fluence low, low level light therapy, tanning bed for the scalp with green and red light. At two weeks we institute nutrient shampoos, medicated shampoos, and at six weeks, 50% um, minoxidil and some other topical nutrients. Uh, and that program would consist uh, of those three things for six months. It will enhance the growth of the, of the actual grafted site. And in sometimes it'll bring out more telogen hair in ungrafted areas, like if we're doing the frontal temporal, you'll see an enhancement in the vertex. So the untransplanted areas often respond with the vasodilatation and, and the stimulation with increased density. Welcome back. Now we are two weeks following our automated 
neograph, and robotic artists at Huey Hair Restoration. By using these advanced techniques with no scarring um, approaches, patients can be back uh, to activities of daily living very quickly. If we look at uh, our patient Adam here now, zoom in just on what I will call the recipient area here, zoom in tightly. You can see the scabs have come off. Usually they come off in the first 10 to 14 days. Because he wears his hair short, he can camouflage that and you really couldn't even tell he had, he had something done. There's a nice alignment of the hair, a nice natural hairline. Uh, and all the hair, the newly transplanted and his own previously transplanted and uh, natural reci um, recipient site area hairs are growing at the same speed and same length. Other options for camouflage if patients don't wear their hair this short is they wear their hair long and the hair from the middle third and the front third cover up the transplanted hair. But again, it looks very presentable at two weeks. If we zoom into the mirror, we can see his donor site. The donor site Zoom in right from perfect. The donor said you would be very hard pressed, very hard pressed to say anything had been done. Um, looks very, very natural, even when wearing your hair very short, like a number one or number two blade. So with artist and neograph technique, the FUE, the donor site looks great. Usually by 10 days to two weeks, you would not know he's had hair restoration. You could never do a strip, strip wrap um, and, and ever wear your hair this short. So the FUE, I think, is the best donor site uh, for patients. Um, excellent survival and graft growth, over 90% survive. Two-phase growth, half the shafts fall out right away. Um, half the shafts start growing right away. And uh, the ones that fall out, still leave a bulb behind that gets vascularized, it starts growing at four or five months. So one year, total density will be achieved. An awesome donor site, and zoom out, come on into the recipient site, and an excellent recipient site. An excellent recipient site, uh, and by two weeks generally, most patients are quite able to go back to work and not feeling self-conscious at all, and generally can wear a baseball cap um, by, the, um, by that first uh, few days once the donor site dressing comes off. Uh, Adam, any pain, any discomfort? Not at all. Even the itching is uh, subsided, so it feels great. So most patients do complain of itching. Um, that's the mast cells and, and then the, the itching that you get from natural uh, scalp and wound healing. So um, histamine blocker and H2 blocker, Claritin that's non-sedating. Uh, and usually just an anti-inflammatory like a total ketoloric. It is not a painful procedure postoperatively. And as you can see with this technique, with the FUE, superior donor site, no visible in your scar, and patients can have a very, very natural looking hair restoration very quickly. Hello and welcome back. We are now one month following our artist and neograph automated and robotic FUE transplant procedure. Our patient now, one month out, has been back to regular exercise and activities uh, since the second week. We start all our patients on a post-op regime, much like uh, after a facelift. We start them on laser and light program, red and green light, starting at one week. We start them on medicated shampoos with nutrient supplement shampoo at two weeks. And by six weeks, we start them on a very, um, a very strong 15% minoxidil serum. If we take a look at uh, the recipient site now uh, on our patient, if we can zoom in right here on the frontal temporal hairline. Um, we do warn the patients about shock loss. Far less common with this technique, with the FUE automated, uh, automated and robotic to get shock loss. Um, the little flick units that are handled uh, during the procedure are, um, are handled delicately. We don't cut down a lot. We don't separate and divide the grafts. We insert them quickly after they've been on ice. And he's had an excellent growth of almost no shock loss. This will continue to grow and increase in density. He's got a very nice looking hairline. And now at one month, he could start uh, um, playing hockey. He could start exercising aggressively. And he could be wearing um, sporting hats and caps. And, and it really have no restriction. His composite graft, which is this uh, bulb and the dermal matrix supporting the, uh, the shaft, is now well integrated into his scalp. We can zoom in very carefully. Uh, again, done with a little slit needle stick in place technique. There's no cobblestoning. Uh, there's no irregularity in the scalp at all. Um, the, um, there's no erythema and all the stigma that one must, uh, used to associate with, uh, with hair transplantation has gone very irregular on side, off side, the hairline, very natural. Now if we look at the, the actual donor site now, 
let's look in the mirror here at the donor site. Uh, we can see great growth. Um, this is a, about a number one blade. Uh, many guys like to wear their hair short or even shaved. And you can see with our technique uh, here, the automated robotic uh, transplantation technique, the one millimeter, 0.9 millimeter, even up to 1.2 millimeter donor site, rotary punches, do not leave any any discernible deformity, any discernible mark. Now, if you were to look closely with loop magnification, you would see very tiny little 0.9, one millimeter hypopigmented um, donor sites. But again, from a conversational distance, even looking closely by zooming in here, you really can't see any kind of discernible donor site. And there's no question of all the techniques that are out there uh, for, um, uh, for harvesting hair. In my estimation as a aesthetic physician, this is by far uh, the most donor site friendly, donor site acceptable. It leaves the patient now available for subsequent transplants. When you take a strip graph, you have one scar. It tightens the scalp. It's hard to take the second and third uh, strip graft for subsequent, um, uh, sub subsequent densification needs. And as uh, these Norwood patients age, they might progress from a two to a four, a three to a six, and need subsequent transplantation. Automated robotic follicular extraction techniques allow us to go back over and over without compromising tensile load on the scalp, without causing linear scars, without sensory disruption or dysesthesia, and give the patients the confidence they need to wear their hair as short as they like, whenever they like. And with a natural recipient, we really can now, uh, in 2014, emancipate our patients from the tyranny of male pattern hair loss.